Uh, I'm David Buckley. I'm an astronomer at the South African Astronomical Observatory, and I've been the project manager for the construction of the building in which Prime Telescope is being installed. So how did it come about? In 2000, we installed the first infrared telescope at Sutherland, which was called the Infrared Survey Facility, or IRSF. And it was a project instigated by Nagoya University in Japan and it became a collaboration between astronomers at the South African Astronomical Observatory and uh, the Japanese partners. And that was a 1.3 meter diameter telescope optimized to work in the infrared and has been a very successful project uh, since it began. And uh, a lot of publications came out of that project and a lot of PhD theses also by Japanese students. So some years ago, I think it was the 15th anniversary of the opening of uh, IRSF, there was a, a conference held in Cape Town, which was sort of reviewing the outputs, the performance, what IRSF had achieved and what the future would be. And so there was discussions about potential future instruments on the IRSF telescope. But there was also a more ambitious idea of building a sort of IRSF2, if you like. So a bigger and better infrared telescope. And that's what became, in the end, Prime, which is a 1.8 meter telescope. Doesn't sound a lot bigger in diameter, but in collecting area, it's the square of the diameter. But more to the point, the optics are designed such that it gives a much, much wider field of view than what the IRSF had. So it has a prime focus camera that gives a one and a half square degree field of view, which is, is very, very big. The project has involved several partners. The Japanese are again leading the telescope side of things, the telescope project. So the same company that built IRSF has built Prime. That's Nishimura company in Japan. The main institution responsible for it is the Osaka University in Japan. So the principal investigator for that, Professor Takahiro Sumi, uh, is from Osaka. The other major partner in Japan is the Astrobiology Center in Tokyo. And then the other partners outside of that, US partners. So NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland and the University of Maryland are both partners in the project. And finally, South Africa through the SAO. This telescope will be one of the, if not the widest field telescope working in the infrared in imaging when it starts its main science program. We have a unique opportunity to exploit the southern skies with this new telescope and do the sort of science which IRSF has started here in South Africa. But in particular, the main science goal for the project, which the people in Osaka are primarily interested in, is looking at gravitational microlensing in the bulge of the galaxy. So this is where you look for stars that are suddenly increasing in their brightness and then decreasing due to the fact that there is an intervening unseen object which is causing deflection and amplification of the light just through the principle of Einstein's theory of relativity, that gravity can affect the trajectory of light and it can act like a lens. So this technique has been used in the optical part of the spectrum but it's never been really attempted in earnest in the infrared, and that's why this telescope is unique. So that's the main science driver, is the detection of gravitational microlenses. And so during the winter months, it will just be steadily taking observations of the central part of our galaxy over and over and over, looking for variable objects that show the signature of these gravitational microlensing. And in particular, what the hope is, is that they will be able to detect much smaller variability, shorter variability that is caused not just by, say, two stars lining up, but a star and a planet around another star lining up. So the aim here is really looking for exoplanets, so planets around other stars through the technique of gravitational microlensing. 
And then a byproduct of this survey that will happen uh, year after year is that there'll be many other variable objects that are discovered or objects we already know about that are variable for which we'll be able to get uh, infrared light curves. So there's a sort of spin-off science which will benefit the community of astronomers that are interested in variable stars. And and that is one of the sort of large communities of astronomers in South Africa are interested in, in such objects. So um, one of the reasons why we're collaborating with NASA, uh, and in particular the Goddard Space Flight Center, is because of the fact that the detectors that are going to be used in the camera on Prime are detectors that have been developed specifically for a NASA mission called the Roman Space Telescope. So this is a telescope which is going to be launched in the mid-2020s. I think the latest is 2025, something like that. It's a Hubble Space Telescope-sized telescope, and it became available for astronomers when the people who wanted this telescope originally said they didn't need it anymore, namely the U.S. military. So this was a telescope that was going to be a spy telescope looking down. So when it became superfluous to their requirements, it was essentially given to the astronomical community. Of course, it's not to say that it wasn't at some cost, because of course they have to have a budget to launch it, which is, is pretty large, and operate it. But nonetheless, this is how the project started, from like a telescope that was already built. So, of course, what's been done since is to develop the detectors for it. And because it's an infrared optimized telescope, it's using the latest technology of what's called hybrid Mercatel detectors or mercury cadmium telluride detectors, which basically sample what we call the near infrared part of the spectrum. So in building the instruments for the Roman Space Telescope, they had flight spares of these infrared arrays. And it's four of those flight spares that have been put into the camera that's going on to Prime. And so these are the biggest infrared arrays you can get. They're 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, and there's four of them. So the size of the area of sky that we'll be able to look at with Prime will be 1.2 degrees on a side, which is about one and a half square degrees. The responsibility I've had um, in managing this project from the SAO perspective is that we're providing the building for the Prime Telescope. And so we took on the responsibility for designing the building and building it. The idea that I had in mind was always to try and build the telescope or install it as high above the ground as we could afford. The reason for that is that for any telescope, you suffer from turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere. It's what causes the twinkling of the stars, is what can blur the images, is the turbulence in the atmosphere. And that turbulence actually increases closer to the ground. There's different layers in the atmosphere, but there's something called the ground layer, which is often the dominant layer causing the blurring. And so the higher up you can build the telescope, the better it is in terms of minimizing the effects of this turbulence created close to the ground. So the design that we had in mind initially was to have uh, an eight meter high concrete pier on which the telescope would sit. That, by the way, the eight meters is a pretty much the height of the salt pier above ground level. Also, we took a lot of uh, lessons learned and experiences with the design of the SALT building. So it's a fairly smooth cylindrical dome. It's high above the ground, not as high as the eight meters we'd originally planned because we had a fixed budget for the project and it became apparent after the costings that eight meters was not quite affordable. So we descoped it to five meters. So the idea was to build all of the building out of steel and to have the walls made out of insulation panels, the same sort of panels that are used in cold stores. And that keeps the whole building quite cool in the daytime, even when in the middle of summer the sun is beating onto the building. It takes a long time for any heat to get into the building. Likewise, when it cools down at night, it cools down very quickly. 
but we can open up louvers which allow the natural ventilation by the wind will just flush out any heat that might have got up through the insulated ceiling of the ground floor. In 2020 was when the steel part of the building was, was planned to be erected. And of course, in early part of that year, March, wasn't it, when COVID came, that basically caused a huge delay, partly because of the lockdown, which meant that there could be no construction happening for some time. But the knock-on effect of that also was the fact that some of the steel furnaces that uh, operate in South Africa were shut down during that period. And once they restarted, there was an enormous backlog of orders for steel, and it was very difficult to come by. So that whole COVID situation had a huge impact on the ability for the contractor to work at the site, but also the supply of the steel that was needed for the building. Nonetheless, the building was completed in the early part of 2021. So at that point, we were able to start thinking about the installation of the dome. And the dome was supplied by a US supplier who had sent the dome by sea from the United States. And it arrived at Sutherland literally the day before the hard lockdown due to COVID. So that was in March 2020, but it stood there until May 2021, when Vili and a group of engineers from Wellington came out and unpacked it and assembled it. And it was eventually installed onto the top of the building in June 2021. Then there was further work done on the inside of the building. Once it was weatherproof, the contractor could start working on on all of the things that needed to be finished on the inside of the building. So the, the telescope company and people from Osaka University were all due to come out in December to begin the installation of the telescope. And literally days before they're about to take their flights was when the Omicron strain of the virus hit. And that caused everything to go pear-shaped in terms of the fact that they could no longer travel. So that meant a postponement from December to now July in 2022, when they finally could come out and begin the installation work.